Hello, and thank you for joining me here on Bright Talk today for seven steps you can take to create the sales culture that you need to succeed. Um, I'll be sharing a lot of tools, a lot of tips, a lot of thought starters today. In fact, I'm feeling especially generous about this very important topic. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you about attachments and other webinars that you can refer to as we go along here. This presentation is intended for any, any sales manager who wants to improve team performance, any sales director or VP who would like to see more consistency and clarity across the sales organization, and for any HR business partner who is supporting the sales function. I'd actually like to start by, by commending you for being here. Far too many people in your shoes mistakenly dismiss the importance of sales culture, and they, they fail to understand just how much impact it can really have on sales results. And so I think that you're wise to be here and uh, think that you can do a lot with the information that we'll talk about today. Let me also introduce myself. I'm Deb Calvert. I'm the founder of the Stop Selling and Start Leading movement. And I'm also the founder of the other Bright Talk channel that you'll want to check out. That's the Sales Experts channel. You can just do a search right here on Bright Talk for that one after this one's all finished. Um, I, I have a Fortune 500 background in sales and HR director roles. And I've been consulting with sales organizations as the president of People First Productivity Solutions for 11 years. I also do research with sales organizations and with buyers. And I work in multiple industries across all sectors to try to cross-pollinate ideas and best practices. After the webinar, after you check out the Sales Experts channel, I'd also like to invite you to, to connect with me. I, I've put my email and my social media handle for you there on screen. Let's just be sure to stay in touch. Um, if you're new to Bright Talk, I should also introduce the channel. This channel is my own personal channel. I'm Deb Calvert. This is the Deb Calvert Sales Channel. I also do HR webinars here. And so you can find a lot of other content. I'll reference some of it as we proceed. On this particular webinar here on Bright Talk, there are some functions that you'll want to be sure to know about. Be sure to notice the Attachments tab. There are some great bonus content in there that I'll like you to, to download and, and use afterwards to put into action what we talk about today. You'll notice there's a Review button. That really helps me out. If you, if you let me know at the end of the presentation what you liked, what you don't like, what you'd like to see and hear about in the future, I really appreciate that feedback. And then there's also a place for you to put in your questions. Just feel free to put a question in there anytime. I will occasionally glance at those as we proceed here, and I'll, I'll fold in the answers where it makes sense. Uh, and if I miss any, I'll come back to them at the end and pick those up too. So that's how this is going to work. Thanks for being here. Thanks in advance for all of your great interaction. Let's dive in. We've got to start here with what are we talking about anyway? What is culture in the workplace? And what you see on screen is a very uh, simplified version. That comes from Dr. Ed Schein, one of the forerunners, the, the pioneers in, in this whole topic of workplace culture. And Dr. Schein, he defines workplace culture and then three levels of culture. The artifacts, those are, that's the evidence of what you can see that represents culture, the underlying beliefs and values, and then even deeper level, the, the assumptions that cause people to have beliefs and values and to take actions and other demonstrable uh, artifacts within the culture. Now, of course, asking a person to define his or her workplace culture, that's kind of like asking a fish to describe water. <laughs> the fish isn't even aware of his environment because he's swimming in it. And he's completely oblivious to the presence uh, or its importance for that matter. And human beings, well, we're the same. When it comes to workplace culture, we're swimming in it. And therefore, we're oblivious to the presence of that culture and we really do have a tough time describing it, even when we're asked a direct question about it. Said another way by Dan Dennison, uh, a well-known authority on workplace culture. He conducts research and teaches at the University of Michigan. And here's how he defines workplace culture. He says it's the underlying values, beliefs, and principles that serve as a foundation for an organization's management system as well as the practices and behaviors 
that both exemplify and reinforce those basic principles. So in a nutshell, summing it all up, workplace culture, um, it establishes the norms of behavior and the shared values of an organization. Really, one way I like to say it is, is it's just it's how we get things done around here. So that begs the question, and why does it even matter what kind of workplace culture we're developing? In a sales organization, it matters because truly high-performance sales cultures and even the subcultures, your subsidiaries, your divisions, your departments, even your individual sales teams, they all have three very compelling attributes, a strong sales culture, consistently produces outstanding sales results. Strong sales cultures, number two, attract, motivate, and retain top sales talent. We need that. <laughs> and three, a strong sales culture can successfully adapt to changing conditions. So that's where we're going. That's what we're after with this entire discussion. And I think that takes us to our next chapter in this story, and that is, where does sales culture come from? Where does it come from? The short answer is it's either intentionally set by the sales manager, the sales director, the sales VP. The HR business partner may help in this. It's either intentionally set by you, or it's a byproduct of whoever happens to be on the current sales team. So it's really about choices. Day in, day out, the choices that you're making will shape and define your culture. Sales managers' choices have an extremely strong influence on the culture. But without deliberate forethought, without mindful attention to the choices that sales managers are making, if you abdicate that role, then the culture will be set by others or It'll end up being a mess. It'll be a confusing clash of choices that don't make sense and are left up to individual interpretation at the individual level. Without a strong, without a clear culture, sellers are basically left without guidance. And their job becomes harder because then they have to make all these individual choices over and over again that are largely guesswork. And they end up spending time and mental energy on all these little choices, on trying to figure out how to run the plays. And of course, as you would imagine, the natural outcome of that is a decline in their sales effectiveness. And all of this, all of this we've already talked about so far, packing it in here, all of this has to be considered when you're framing up your sales culture. If you don't take the considerations you now see on screen into account, all of them, then the overemphasis on one or some of these aspects will make your culture skewed, even if you don't intend for it to be. Let me give you a classic example. When there's a heavy focus and a lot of choices that are made and a lot of communication outwardly related to business goals, productivity, and new products and systems, then there might be significantly less attention paid to people development, sales coaching, sales training, performance support, and the culture may not be signaling that the organization wants to invest in the growth and retention of people. Now that result can become extreme. It can become a culture of cutthroat internal competition where you know the, the runner-up just gets steak knives. And uh, numbers are the only thing that people seem to care about. And this kind of culture implodes when success becomes unsustainable due to high turnover, uh, limited promotability of sales talent, and a winning at all costs mentality that impairs customer satisfaction, innovation, and employee engagement. So we're looking instead for a balance and need to take into account all the bullet place, points you see on screen. And I want to show you how to do that and give you seven steps for, for working through that. But you'll know this is for you if your culture needs an adjustment. If, if your culture needs an adjustment, you're probably seeing gaps like these. Um, longer than necessary sales cycles, small deal sizes, inadequate prospecting to keep the pipeline filled, 
uh, excessive turnover, low engagement of the sales team members, or uh, negativity or resistance to team collaboration, and so on. These are all indicators that there could be some sort of gap or hole in your culture. And it's tempting, it really is, tempting to blame the sales team or the challenging goals that are being pushed down or other external factors. Those are the typical places that we place blame for a negative workplace environment. Before you leap to those conclusions, though, I'd like to suggest that you pause and assess your culture and your own day-to-day -day management choices that might inadvertently be causing these problems to happen. See, the best place to start when considering what your culture could and should be is what you're doing. And let's start universally. Let, let, let's start at the top of the organization with the brand promise that you're making as an employer. So go back. Uh, go back and read your seller job descriptions and your job postings, and take a fresh look at your company's web page. Take a look especially at that page that says, About Us. And then review the company's values along with the ones that you personally profess. And here's the tough question to ask yourself. Does the reality in the day-to-day -day reflect the things you're saying to attract new talent? And do your sales manager's actions represent the promises that are made or implied? For example, and this is a real example, I see this quite often, consider a company that says something like this. Right on their website and in all their job postings, they say something like, our people are our greatest asset. We invest in our future by investing in our people. That conjures certain expectations. So imagine you come in with those expectations as a new seller. You're attracted to this promise. Imagine what it's like then after you've been hired and you soon discover that you have no access to the company's emerging leaders program or the weekly brown bag training sessions. And in fact, you receive virtually no formal onboarding and there's no training in selling skills only a two-hour product overview and a half day, your first day, in HR to fill out paperwork. And over time, you soon realize that there's no mentoring, no real coaching, and no formal performance appraisal. Imagine what it's like. You came in with that promise, and now you realize that you need to spend every minute of your workday chasing revenue so you can earn bigger commissions because that's your job. And this is a cultural choice made by managers. It, it impacts the culture of the entire organization. It also impacts the long-term health of the business as new hires grapple with these mixed messages. And as sellers seek opportunities elsewhere so they can receive training and get career development opportunities. Now let me be very careful here to, to point out that if the sales culture you desire is one that's short-term, and if it is all about today's revenue production, then this is a valid choice. But you just want to be sure that that's what you're also communicating as an employer. And on the other hand, if you and your company strategically plan for something different, then a culture shift is, is clearly needed so that you can line all these things up appropriately. So let's just walk it back. Do your sales managers know do they know what the company values, norms, expectations, and long-term strategies are? Or are they getting so narrowly focused on revenue production that the message they hear is that nothing else matters? If you're using your brand promise and your strategic plan for context, then these are the seven questions. They are also the seven steps but they will put them first in the form of questions. These are the seven questions that the sales leadership and manager team needs to be answering. I'm going to take these one by one. By answering these questions thoughtfully and thoroughly, what you'll be building toward is your vision for a sales culture that meets today's needs as well as tomorrow's vision. 
And as we cover all seven of these in greater detail as we proceed, I, I, I want you to know that you can do these things internally, but if you're interested, if you need some outside help to survey or interview or observe your culture and objectively help you answer these questions, please shoot me an email. This is what we do. We offer consulting and assessment services that will help you to get started. Now, step one, that's a big question. How do you want your work to be done? That's a big question, and it will take more time and thought than anything else on this list. But please don't skip it. It is your rock-solid foundation for everything else you need to do for sales culture. By the way, you're about to see a whole lot of information coming at you pretty quickly, so I want to point out, if you haven't found it already, that in the attachments tab, I've given you a PDF of these slides. I don't normally do that, but I've really packed a lot into this webinar, and I want you to have actionable places where you can begin. So take that PDF and, and use these seven steps as your guide internally. So step one, we said this is about figuring out how you want the work to be done. And this box model can help you to make some choices about your culture. Of course, it's a given, we all know, and, and rightly so, that every sales organization does want sales results. And I trust that getting the right results is already a focus in your organization because that's what you do. The right results, those are featured here in the box model. They're in the two boxes on the right-hand side. They have the RR designation, RR standing for right results. If you are getting the wrong results, WR, you're falling in one of the two boxes on the left-hand side of that box model. And there are certainly things you can do, certain sales productivity drivers like hiring, training, compensation, uh, territory alignment, performance standards, all of those can drive you over into the right results buckets. And we do, here at People First Productivity Solutions, we do also consult in those areas more importantly, we have partners who have deep level expertise in those areas. So if you are looking for a referral, you can also email me and I'll help you get connected with the right people so you don't have to continue being in those boxes. It's, it's obviously not the, the place you want to be if you're getting the wrong results. But mainly though, I want to talk about this second variable in the box model. That's how you get your results. The right way, RW, in the top two boxes, or the wrong way, WW in the bottom two boxes. See, you need to define uh, for your team or for your organization what is the right way and what's the wrong way. Without that definition, you may be finding yourself hitting the number short term and then experiencing all sor sorts of unintended consequences, all sorts of long-term issues. Classic example, Wells Fargo. They got the right results, but clearly those results were attained the wrong way as their sellers were opening up ghost accounts that were fraudulent and were not authorized by their customers. But less extreme. There are many top producers who ride a wave. They ride a wave of success from a single account's explosive growth. And these top producers, they make their goals consistently because of that one account. And they tend to get a little complacent. They neglect the continued building at the top of the funnel. These are the right results the wrong way. That's the top left box. The right results the wrong way because it's putting the organization or the sales territory at a risk with too much riding on a single gravy train account. So if you're getting the right results the wrong way, the, I believe I said the wrong box, it's the lower right-hand box. If you're in that box, you need some sales culture attention. You need some time spent on answering this question, how do we want to get things done around here? Other examples the wrong way, that could include how your prospects are treated, how your accounts are managed and serviced, um, what kinds of sales activities get prioritized, how much time and attention is dedicated to this continual development of selling skills, and, and so much more. Your decisions about defining the right way will be the foundation of your sales culture. So just this is so important to really give this some time and thought. The how aspect is so important that it requires a lot of thought and conversation and consensus among all the sales managers and sales leaders. 
So this, it's in the PDF. You'll be able to read it better when you download it. Right. You can start with these questions to assess how your sellers are already doing business today. And the next, you can pick and choose which shifts, if any, you would like for them to make. So if you're looking at the options, let's just take the top row. Do you want your sellers to spend more time visiting established customers or more time calling on new prospects? How do you want them to get the right results? What's the mix for that group of sellers in terms of their activity? And if you're looking down that list a little further, let's take, oh, the fifth row, uh, calling frequently on, in option one, fifth row. Do you want them calling frequently on a few targeted customers and prospects with a frequency strategy? Or do you want more of a reach strategy for them to call on lots and lots of customers and prospects? You have to tell them, otherwise they're making it up on their own and they're taking time and investing their own thought, trial and error, and, and hoping to figure this out. So you want to start with questions like these to assess how your sellers are already doing business today, and then picking and choosing which of those shifts you would like them to make. If you have different sales roles, so let's say you're an organization that has an SDR team and an account manager team, well then of course you're going to want to consider these questions for each group. They might not end up with exactly the same sales culture. And doing so will give you both culture clarity and role clarity. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little story. I'll, I'll try to keep it short. About a team of sales managers, six of them, who use this tool, this very same thing that you're looking at, to open a culture-shaping discussion. So of the six managers on that team, none of them were absolutely in agreement about all these, these rows. Two had practically diametrically opposed responses all the way across the board. And sellers in that organization, then, they were pretty much left to their own devices to figure out how to be successful. And so long as they made their numbers, no one really scrutinized how they got there. So these two managers um, who were diametrically opposed, and then we had two other managers who were opposed even to the whole idea of declaring a preference for how things should be done. Their assumption was that sellers preferred autonomy and, and wouldn't want to be micromanaged and told these kinds of things. So we stepped back and we went and surveyed the sellers and asked them these questions along with a third one. And here's what we learned. We learned that the sellers were every bit as all over the board as their managers were, no surprise. The sellers, by the way, did not align with their ma managers' answers because they saw different things in different places across the organization. But not only that, the sellers, they, they resented not being given more clear direction. They wanted clarity about what managers expected them to do beyond just making their numbers. And the sellers felt that all this inconsistently, for them, they interpreted it as favoritism. And the ones who worked for some managers felt that sellers working for other managers had it easier. And that was disproven because there were sellers on every single team who felt that way about every single other team. It was, it was a mess. And in response to that third question, we also learned that the sellers felt these options were so inconsistent that a single manager was giving mixed messages multiple times in a given week. And they were frustrated, and they felt like the managers and the company didn't really know what they were doing. So your, your deliberate decisions about how the work should be done are critically important, not just for where you want your sellers to focus, but also for your own credibility. Let's jump ahead to number two, because there are seven things for us to be thinking about here. When you begin to make changes in your culture, I'd like you to do it with this in mind. You are, if you're like most people, you're quite likely focused at the top of this pyramid, and you're driving for results. And maybe you've also come down one place, you're focused on actions. You've, you've told your sellers which activities to perform and what to measure, and you've selected activities that drive toward those desired results. But again, if you're like most, that's probably as far as you went. But we know there's more. We know from research that there's more that we ought to do and more that people need to be intrinsically motivated and deeply committed to those actions. See, actions, they, they stem from beliefs. And all of us, we're human. We will do things, even when the boss is not looking, <laughs> if we believe in the merit of doing those things. 
So to get actions, you want to hire people with strong beliefs. And then you want to reinforce and draw out those beliefs to renew their commitment and their intrinsic motivation so they'll perform the desired actions. Oh, by the way, um, there are other webinars that I've prepared for you here in this channel, here on Bright Talk, and they go deeper into the topic of motivating sellers. So I'm not going to go any deeper than this one slide, but I just want you to know that that's available for you on demand if, if you need more. Okay, so before we get all the way to the foundation of our, of our pyramid, which is experiences, we have to kind of walk it through here. Beliefs, what we believe, we believe that for a reason. Our beliefs come from our experiences. We will never believe something as adults just because someone tells us to. And we don't adopt beliefs just because we get a paycheck. We develop our beliefs because we've had experiences that lead to those beliefs. So the job of the sales manager and uh, the work of creating sales culture, it's largely about providing experiences that lead to beliefs. And if you want your sellers to believe, for example, that they can help buyers and earn higher commissions by selling an add-on feature, then you have to show them, not just tell them. You have to provide the testimonials and the hands-on experiences and the early successes that will shape their beliefs. And this will have far greater impact than simply giving them a list of activity standards to call on X number of prospects and present X number of upsell proposals. You see, culture comes from doing this deeper level work, from communicating and modeling the norms of the organization. You bring the culture to life by communicating and modeling the experiences that produce the beliefs that you would like sellers to internalize and act on to get the results that you're looking for. Now, beliefs and experiences, they do. It's, it's unavoidable. They overlap your organizational and even our personal values. So as you're considering how to do business and what experiences to offer your sellers, you can also get some clarity on your organizational values. What you see here, this is the impact of values clarity on workplace commitment. And these numbers, they, they come from a seven-point scale. So it's great. It, it's important to hire people with a strong clarity of individual values. In fact, you should do this because low clarity of personal values has a much weaker showing when it comes to commitment to the job. But if you're looking at individual values at a 6.12 out of a 7-point scale, notice that you can get even stronger commitment when there's also clarity of organizational values. So the idea here for your culture is to hire for strong values, personal values, the right ones, people coming in with the right beliefs, and then create a culture of strong and clear organizational values too. And don't ever expect one to substitute for the other. Number four is uh, our performance expectations, which we've briefly mentioned. Right? Experiences and beliefs and actions lead to results. But you'll need to set performance standards if you want to ensure clarity in your culture. You may wish to consider setting activity standards that stem from experiences and beliefs, and that will help you to select the right ones, the right activities, instead of making up arbitrary numbers. For example, maybe your process looks like this. The experience of your top seller leads to a widely held belief that 10 prospecting calls a day is what it takes to keep the pipeline filled. So if you'll make links between the experiences of that top seller and your expectations that 10 calls a day be made, this will help people to genuinely believe and be committed to that number. And if you have performance standards, you are providing clarity and consistency in your sales culture. But you want to be sure that you're measuring what really matters. And that's, a, uh, that's another separate webinar. So uh, on this channel, go and look for that one about um, are you measuring what matters. It, it, too, is available on demand whenever you want it to supplement this one. And it's all about the smart use of performance standards. Now let's just keep going here. Let's go a little bit deeper here with the idea of how much control you really want your managers to have versus how much autonomy you want your sellers to have, because that's a great big piece of sales culture. 
And there are pros and cons to both choices. A high degree of control has certain benefits, and a low degree of control has different benefits. And on the downside, the high degree of control means that you have to be prepared to accept and, and deal with certain uh, disadvantages, same with low control. But if you have a, let's say you have a green sales team, and there's a need for them to receive a lot of coaching and support and inspection, and if that's the case, then a high control from the manager is typically the better choice. Be sure that you're set up, though, in a way that liberates sales managers from reporting or other tangential functions so they can actually do the work of observing, evaluating, diagnosing, coaching, and developing these team members. Let's say, on the other hand, that you have a results focus and, a, and very little need to pay attention to the way the sales team is operating. In that case, you might favor a low control management structure. And that is a valid choice, especially in organizations where the sellers are long-term employees and the managers are focused on non-selling activities. The, the important takeaway here, the thing to consider, is to be sure you don't have a mismatch. I've seen a whole lot of sales organizations where it's low control, despite the significant needs of sellers, for much more support than that choice affords them. And the dead giveaway that I can almost always see immediately when this is happening, when this mismatch occurs, is that you have high turnover and underperforming sellers. This is one of the first things you ought to consider if that's the situation that you're in. Now, of course, again, in your organization, you might have um, different job levels with different degrees of manager control, and I recommend this. If you have a team with SDRs, they're typically newer, and your teams of account managers might be more experienced. And if that's the case for you, be sure to match your managers and their degree of control, their style, with the appropriate teams so that you are yielding what you want within those subcultures. Now, the fifth aspect, let's, ooh, time flying here. Uh, the fifth aspect of sales culture that you'll want to consider is what you're hoping to see in future success. What is success going to look like? Here are five questions that you can be asking yourself internally. You want to be sure that the answers are consistent across the organization. Success, right? who is highly esteemed? That should not look different day to day. It should not look entirely different one manager to another's team for the same job function. What makes someone promotable should not be entirely subjective and uh, constantly fluctuating. What you want people to understand and know about success ought to be fairly consistent because that will help to shape your sales culture. Also, think back to our pyramid and be sure to notice that being rewarded and even seeing someone else be rewarded, that's an experience down there at the base of our pyramid. The experiences related to rewards create beliefs about what, manages, what, 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 what matters to the manager and to the organization. And those beliefs will lead to the actions, among others, who also want to be rewarded or those who want to be rewarded again. So naturally, it follows that rewarding the right behaviors ultimately gets you to the right results. If you have a message that you're putting out there, you can't say it once and expect it to stick. Culture is comprised of many, many, many repeated statements actions, and reiterations. So go ahead and be a broken record when it comes to providing clarity about how you want the work to be done. And aim for alignment. Keep your messages simple. Tie them back to the overarching strategy or belief that you're hoping to see others internalize. And express it in writing. Express it verbally. Talk about it casually, formally, in recognition, and in constructive feedback, too. Make sure all of those messages are aligned and that you're delivering them in multiple ways and that they even align uh, throughout the organization, up, down, sideways, across, diagonally, everything. If you feel like this is an area where you might need to do a little bit more work, uh, there's a, a great book you can read. It's by Pat Lencioni. It's called The Advantage. And it will help you to get that clarity for yourself as a manager or across your organization if you're dealing bigger picture. 
Now, as you're thinking about how to eradicate these mixed messages, as you're working with the clarity and deliberate thought work in the, in the other five steps that preceded this one, then you are on your way to creating a deliberate sales culture. So you'll just want to be sure to also be looking for accidental interlopers that could undermine your culture. Go back to some of those earlier questions and come back to them over and over again. Do your hiring practices identify and select for people who have the right experiences and beliefs to get results the right way as you've defined it? And are your performance standards directing people to do the things that will give them experiences that shape the beliefs that lead to the actions and results you're looking for? What is it that you're rewarding and recognizing? How does that fit in with the entire culture you're creating? And when you let people go, does it make sense to others in the culture? Is it performance-based only? Or is there a consequence for not doing things the right way too? And I'm asking that question because not long ago I was coaching a sales VP who was reluctant to fire an employee who was repeatedly and obviously just just grossly sexually harassing another employee. And not only that, the same seller, he was also caught up in um, overstating his expenses and he got busted. So the reluctance on the part of the sales VP was for one reason only. This was his top producer, his top producer. So he was reluctant to let him go despite all these egregious offenses. But at the same time, there were three other people within a three-month period who were also let go because of underperformance on their sales numbers. And the message that that sent to the team wasn't one the sales VP intended, and unfortunately it was a message that ultimately had the sales VP in a precarious position of his own having to defend those decisions. So things got pretty ugly pretty quickly, and the culture needed a, a radical overhaul as a result just to, to course correct. Okay, last but not least, you're working through thinking about your culture, you're going to take the PDF and, and use these tools to start asking some questions and doing some introspection inside your own organization. Remember, what you're aiming to do ultimately is to change the experience that people are having. Your clear messages will provide the experiences that you want people to have. Manager decisions do send clear messages. So step seven is to routinely um, audit yourself. As a sales manager, are your messages and decisions aligned with the short-term or the long-term employer brand of your organization? How about alignment with your organizational values and not to mention alignment with your own professed style of managing? Right? That's why you spent that time early on doing the right results, right way definition of what you want your sales culture to be. And there are so many other clear messages that without even realizing it, you're sending on a day-to-day -day basis too. So that's why you have to think about everything we've already talked about plus what you now see on this new piece of, of information. It's just worded differently and, and sorted differently to help you think about is this a short-term culture I'm creating, all about revenue production, or are we looking at the long-term, helping to think about the welfare of the company? And in each one of these areas, you'll be thinking about your actions, your decisions, your messages that you communicate, and what it signals to the rest of the organization. Beyond this, we can even get more granular. So for those of you who are interested, I've also attached a link. Um, it's a, a sales manager's daily checklist for boosting employee engagement. And it's a, a, an online tool, so you'll drop down, you'll find a single function that you want to work on, probably the area where you think you might have a gap, and it will just give you an opportunity to extend what we've been talking about today into a daily process of little tiny small decisions, micro choices that you're making that do impact employee engagement and your sales culture. So you're downloading that employee engagement checklist that's for sales managers, the PDF of all these slides so that you can begin working through this process and you should allow yourself time for that to happen. You've already copied down my email address and my social media handle in case you want some additional support. And there's one more attachment there I gave you an infographic, maybe something to hang up in your office or to refer to occasionally to help you through this entire process. We have covered a whole lot here. 
And this is serious business. I hope if you're not taking anything else away, you realize this is not just something that's happenstance. Sales culture isn't lightweight. It's not a byproduct. It is something that the smartest organizations and the highest achieving sales leaders do deliberately. And, and they do it all the time. It, it's, it's constantly something they put thought and attention toward. And the reason they do that is because you can significantly improve your results when you improve your sales culture. And we can help. Here at People First Productivity Solutions, we build organizational strength by putting people first. I'm Deb Calvert, President of People First Productivity Solutions, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you and helping you get started. If you have any questions, here's a last call for those. I just have one that's posted so far that I haven't answered yet. And that question is, is culture something that an individual sales manager can actually handle, or does it have to be from the top? I get this question a lot, and the answer is yes. And there is probably a, a pervasive culture across your organization. And it's got a ripple effect, but oftentimes the sales department, that, that's the outlier. The sales culture seems to be for everybody else but not for sales. That's because the salespeople are so uh, out of the day-to-day the -day interactions with others. They're either on the phone or in the field, and they seldom have interaction across the entire organization as so many others do, so they don't naturally absorb the culture. But also because their performance standards are different and the things they pay attention to are different, and because they, they also tend in some places to be elevated uh, in an elite status. Lots of things separate the sales department. And so your own culture should not be so different that it doesn't align with, with the rest of the culture. That wouldn't make sense. But you, on any given team, certainly can have a subculture or your own culture that supports the people and the way that you want to get work done. Wherever people are having experiences, that's where culture comes from. So in a, a sales team, a single sales team, you can have a culture based on the experiences, beliefs, and then later the actions and the results that come from there. Okay, with no other questions, I'm going to put back three minutes into your day because you were expecting 45 minutes. We took 42. Please don't hesitate to be in touch with me, and don't forget to post your review with some feedback for me uh, for the next time we get together. Thanks so much.